welcome, welcome everybody to the Max Planck Humboldt Research Award 2020. And so different it is from last year. Where are you all? Where are the winners? Where are the lauditors? The good news within the bad news is that most of you are at home and contributing to keeping the virus at bay. But one thing hasn't changed from last year. Tonight, we're talking about world-class research. Tonight, together, we're working on strengthening the links between the research and scientific community in Germany with the communities all over the world. And we're talking big money, 1.5 million euros. Million Euro. Der Max Planck Humboldt Forschungspreis ist einer der höchst dotierten Forschungspreise in Deutschland. Wir zeichnen damit besonders innovative Forschung aus. Und wir wenden uns gezielt an Forschende im Ausland. Denn wir wollen noch mehr kluge, innovative Köpfe nach Deutschland bringen, damit sie hier nachhaltige Kooperationen und Forschungsprojekte aufbauen damit der Forschungsstandort Deutschland weiterhin zu den stärksten der Welt gehört. Exzellente Forschung lebt von internationaler Zusammenarbeit. Das zeigt sich gerade jetzt. Und deswegen laden wir mit der Verleihung der Max-Planck-Humboldt-Medaille einen weiteren herausragenden Forscher nach Deutschland ein. Ein Zeichen für Exzellenz und Internationalität in Wissenschaft und Forschung. Und damit heiße ich Sie, Ganz herzlich willkommen zum Austausch mit dem diesjährigen Max Planck Humboldt Forschungspreisträger. Der Max Planck Humboldt Forschungspreis verbindet eine beachtliche Fördersumme mit größtmöglicher Flexibilität für die Preisträger. Von der Wahl des Kooperationspartners bis zur Art der Zusammenarbeit. Das soll bahnbrechende Erkenntnisse und wissenschaftliche Durchbrüche ermöglichen. Mit diesen flexiblen Rahmenbedingungen ergänzt der Preis das deutsche Förderspektrum um ein Programm, das herausragenden Talenten maximale Gestaltungsfreiheit bietet. Kreative Forschungsformate sind gewünscht, das zeichnet den max planck humboldt forschungspreis aus und macht ihn so attraktiv auch für jüngere Forscherinnen und Forscher. Das Kleine erforschen, um das große Ganze zu verstehen. Dies war eine Methode, die schon Alexander von Humboldt bei seinen Beobachtungen der Natur zu geradezu visionären Einsichten verhalf. Vorbilder wie Alexander von Humboldt inspirieren uns, die aktuellen Herausforderungen gemeinsam anzugehen, über Grenzen hinweg, disziplinäre und nationale Grenzen. Unsere Preisträger leisten einen entscheidenden Beitrag für den internationalen wissenschaftlichen Austausch in einer Welt, in der Unvoreingenommenheit und Zusammenhalt immer wieder neu behauptet werden müssen. In diesem Jahr zeichnen wir zwei Biologen für ihre herausragende Forschung aus. Der Max-Planck-Humboldt-Forschungspreis 2020 geht an Roberto Bonasio und die Max-Planck-Humboldt-Medaille 2020 geht an Luciano Marafini. Ganz herzlichen Glückwunsch. Roberto Bonasio analysiert eine Metaebene der Genregulation, die in einem Ameisenstaat genetisch identischen Individuen eine erstaunliche Anpassungsfähigkeit verleiht. Ein wertvolles Modellsystem für diese, wie wir heute wissen, verbreitete epigenetische Regulation. Luciano Marafini hat gezeigt, wie sich Bakterien mit Hilfe molekulargenetischer Werkzeuge gegen Angriffe von Viren verteidigen. Und genau diese Werkzeuge werden heute technisch als die sogenannten genetischen Scheren zur gezielten Editierung von Genen eingesetzt. Das Erforschen dieser Mechanismen in kleinen und kleinsten Lebewesen, in Modellsystemen also, ebnet den Weg zu einem Verständnis von Prinzipien in der lebenden Natur. Lieber Roberto Bonasio, lieber Luciano Marafini, Ganz herzlichen Glückwunsch für diese bahnbrechenden Ansätze und Ihre wunderbaren Werkzeuge in diesem Modellsystem. Wir freuen uns alle für Sie über diese Auszeichnung. Liebe Herr Bonasio, lieber Herr Marafini, wir alle freuen uns unheimlich, dass Sie Ihre spannende Forschung gemeinsam mit Kolleginnen und Kollegen in Deutschland weiter vorantreiben werden. Ganz herzliche Glückwünsche an Sie beide. Ich wünsche Ihnen eine spannende Zeit, tolle Begegnungen und natürlich reichlich neue Erkenntnisse.
Congratulations. And one topic, CRISPR-Cas, that has been in the news so much the last couple of years, there even has been a Nobel Prize this year in chemistry. So Luciano Marafini, who gets the medal this year, he is in very, very good company with his topic. Today, however, we'll take a deep dive into the topic for Roberto Bonasio, and that is all about this little animal here, ants. Now, a couple of fun facts. What do you know about ants? For example, how many ants are there on planet Earth? Of course, nobody <laughs> went out to count them all, but the ballpark figure is one quadrillion. That is one billion million ants. And among this one quadrillion ants, there are plenty of different species, different types of them. And one thing most of them have in common is that when the queen, the big ant who lays the eggs, when she dies eventually, the whole colony will perish. Except for a couple of species where after the death of the queen, the little worker ants, they start to fight out a bit like Game of Thrones and the strongest one will become the new queen. And you wonder, how is that possible? Because the worker will grow ovaries, will grow in size, will live five times longer than the worker would have lived otherwise. How and why can that happen? Well, that's a question for the winner of this year's award. He is Associate Professor of Cell and Developmental Biology, and uh, he does that at the Perlman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania. Here is Roberto Bonasio. Ciao, Roberto. Hi, Andreas. How are you doing? Now, did you spend last night sleeping or were you in front of the TV, CNN, Fox or anything to, to figure out who's going to be the next US president? I spent the last night looking forward to me talking to you and the audience about our working ends. Tell me more about them. How does that crazy thing happen at all? Well, um, let, me, let me tell you about it. Can we get the slides up? Okay, sli sli up? slides are officially up, but keep, keep talking. Worst case, I show the little okay. end to everybody in the camera. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, so I, I'm incredibly honored um, to be selected for this award. And I thought I would um, give an introduction to the topic and, and mention why are we doing all of this. And so I think that uh, the big question that motivates my research is how can a finite set of genetic information specify something as complex as our body and as sophisticated as our brain? So in my lab, uh, we take a reductionist approach, which means we break down the problem in small pieces and we start it in um, simple systems. We look at it in isolated cells. We look at it in uh, flatworms, Drosophila, that fruit fly that you see there. Uh, but as you mentioned, the, the star of the show today is um, our specific ant species, this Harpegnetos saltator, which is the little um, ant that you see on the bottom right. So we all know that the basic unit of biological information is the gene, and the gene is a piece of DNA with a sequence of letters that contains the instructions to make a protein. And the protein is something that goes around in the cell and, and does things. And for example, one thing that it can do is decide whether a pea should have a wrinkled skin or smooth skin, and little changes in the DNA sequence change the protein a little bit and that affects what, what we can see and how, how the organism functions. Um, but when it comes to understanding how, how this works out in the brain, it's a bit of a puzzle because there are 20,000 of these genes and really most of them we share with other animals that have very different brains from ours. And so how can you, from this limited set of genes, make something so complicated and sophisticated as the human brain. And so perhaps this is not as much of a paradox because with a very finite, very small set of musical notes, um, you can make very different music. And it depends which notes you play, when you play them, and in what combination you play them, and, and you can really cover the whole um, spectrum. 
And so in similar ways, depending on in which order you play or you turn on the different genes and in what combination, you can get uh, very different types of cells from a unique shared stem cell. So in other words, the cells in your body, the cells in your brain, the neurons, and the cells in your blood, the leukocytes, for example, they all have the same exact genes, but somehow they use them in a different way, and that gives them their specific function. So we know, we have learned over the years, that um, one way that genes are selected to be turned on or off is by the appearance of these little chemical tags on top of the DNA. They can actually be on top of the DNA or they can be on top of these uh, little balls here that you see where the DNA is wrapped tightly um, into the cell, which are called nucleosomes. And uh, because this is an additional layer of information, it's something that goes on top of the DNA sequence. It doesn't change it. It just specifies when you should use which gene. Um, we call that epigenetic because it means that it's on top of the genetic information. And we know that this epigenetic information is very important for brain function because when something goes wrong with these little labels on the genes or with the machines that write them or read them or uh, remove them, uh, very often what you find is that um, you find neurological disorders, neurodevelopmental disorders, something goes wrong with the brain. So the brain needs all this information uh, to function and develop properly. And so many years ago, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, we like to take this uh, approach where we break a problem down in a simpler uh, system. And many years ago, we thought, uh, where can we study this idea of genes turning on and off and affecting brain function and behavior? And so we thought that ENTS, perhaps, could be a good model system to study this. And the reason is, in the ant colony, you have very different individuals that perform very different functions. You have the queen, as you mentioned, uh, who reproduces and, uh, and you know, spend most of its time in the nest. And then you have workers that carry out all kinds of different tasks to keep the colony alive. And even the workers, uh, you can have different kinds of workers depending on the species. And the beauty of it is all these individuals with these incredibly different behaviors, they all have the same exact genes, just like the cells in your body. And so we thought that by studying how turning on and off certain genes can uh, affect your worker behavior or your queen behavior, uh, that will teach us a lot on how epigenetics can, can regulate brain function. And so this, the species that we chose for this study, as you already mentioned it, is Arpegnetos saltator, which is an ant uh, from, uh, originally from India. And the reason we chose it is specifically because of this unique property. If we can go to the next slide. Um, which is that, as you mentioned, like all, every other ant species, you have queens and you have workers, and they have very different behaviors. However, unlike most other ant species, in Harpegnetos, when, when the queen dies, Uh, what happens is that the remaining workers start arguing with each other on who should be the next queen. And I actually brought a little movie to show you how that argument plays out in real life. So these are Harpegnetos ants, these are all workers, and the queen has been removed and then try to decide who should be promoted to queen. So what happens is, is that in a matter of days or maybe just a few weeks, some, one or some of the workers actually become new acting queens. And with this change in social status comes an incredible and dramatic switch in their behavior. They stop working, they stop doing all the tasks they were doing before, and they start acting like queens, and their social relationship with the other ant in the colonies uh, changes accordingly. And so this is a real unique opportunity to study how the brain can change, an adult brain can change just by changes in which genes are on or off and affect your social status and behavior. And so I, that's why we chose these pieces to study and I will mention a couple of things we discovered in the last few years since we've been working with these pieces. Um, 
First thing, um, we, as I mentioned, wanted to know what genes are on or off depending on the social behavior. And so one behavior that only the workers do, one thing that the, only the workers do in the colony is hunting. So harpignathos are pretty vicious hunters. They will sting and paralyze that cricket to feed it to their larvae. And that's something that only the workers do. And so by comparing what genes are on or off in the workers before and after they transform into queens, and whether or not they're hunting, we actually discovered one gene that is very important to turn on uh, this hunting behavior. So this gene happens to be named coratonin, and it encodes for a small molecule that fortunately we can synthesize in the lab. And so we were able to take this molecule and inject it into ants that haven't decided yet whether they want to be queens or workers. And by just changing this one molecule, we force them to make a decision and to become workers and to start hunting. So that's one example of a single gene that just by being switched on or off can affect something as complex as the entire set of behaviors going to hunt in the crickets. So something else that happens when these workers become queens is, uh, is about their longevity. So, and I think you mentioned this too in the introduction. So the workers in Harpignathos live six to seven months. However, the same workers, if they're transformed into queens, they end up living up to three years, even four years. So that's a five-fold extension in, in lifespan. And we thought what in their brain could be possibly happening that protects uh, the brain from you know such extended um, aging. And so one thing that we found is we compared um, the gene expression and what cells are where. And what we saw was that a particular cell population, which is called enchitinglia, is, if we can go back to the previous slide, uh, perfect. Is, uh, is very much expanded when the workers become queens. So just by changing the social status, the actual cells inside the brain change in numbers. And these cells are cells whose job is to protect the brain from damage. And so it makes perfect sense that if these workers, by becoming queens, will live five times longer, they also expand the cell population that we know can protect the brain from aging. And so that's, those are two examples of things that we found. And I think we just began to scratch the surface of our uh, friend Harpignetos end. And I think much more remains to be discovered. And uh, um, I also hope I convinced you that it's, it's worth looking at, at how this uh, transformation from workers to queens can teach us something about the effects of gene regulation, that is, whether genes are on or off in our own brain. Um, which hopefully could help us answer the question of how genetic information can specify uh, something as complex as our own brain and, and that. And so I just wanted to say one more word because uh, it's important to know that all of science is, is collegial and collaborative. And so uh, I am honored by this award, but I owe it to all the people that have made it possible to, to do this work. So the, the top picture is member of my lab. Um, Emily Li Hong and Yanko in particular are the scientists who work on the end project. And to finish, I need to say that my former mentor, Danny Reinberg, my current mentor and director, Shelly Berger, had the original vision of studying epigenetics in ants. And then last but not least, Jürgen Liebig is the person who pointed us in the direction of Harpignetos as a unique model to study epigenetics. Thank you so much, Alberto. And I can see it's not like an ant colony with one queen calling the shots and then no real collaboration. But on the other hand, when you told me that story about the ants fighting it out, I couldn't help think of the typical situation when there is a new vacancy for professorship. Because plenty of researchers can turn themselves into voracious fighting machines. And then once one has actually become professor, the behavior of him or her changes completely. Does that ring a bell? 
So the question is, what genes uh, turn on and off, right, that make a assistant professor into a tenured professor or a postdoctoral professor? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that, but I see some, some similarity. Okay, now follow on on that one. If you can switch on and off with the ants, if you can magically protect their glia cells, when can you do that to me so that I, so that I live to 400? Hopefully, as soon as possible, right? I mean, there are, the reason we started this in ants is because it's a simpler system, but our hope and belief, um, and, and this has definitely been true in the past, is that what we find has general validity. Um, and so particularly as far as the glia goes, the functional equivalent of these particular cells that we found are regulated naturally um, there is a functional equivalent in your brain, it's called microglia, and this is actually the expertise of one of my co-sponsors uh, in Freiburg that will do the, the work funded by this award with me, uh, Marco Print. And uh, microglia is important for a number of things in the, in the human brain, including perhaps protecting us from aging. Mm -hmm. So if we think about the way forward, you're probably not going to jump from ants right to humans, but what would be the steps in between going forward and finding applications that benefit humanity? Yeah, the typical progression is uh, that um, you find something, a pathway or a phenomenon in, in your model organism and then you look for its validity in an in a organism that is closer right, to humans. So the progression would be we discover this in ants, we validate them maybe in some other insects that are easier to manipulate, but then typically you will want to study it in mouse uh, or, you know, other suitable organisms before you consider, you know, at all doing anything in humans. Um, you know, it's important to think it, it's always nice to study a process in simplest organism that, that has that process. And so that's why we think there is a lot of epigenetics going on in the ant brain and ants are much simpler than mice. And so we start it in ends. Okay. Now, by the way, it's not just questions for me, but everybody out there, please, we want your questions as well. And you may have noticed in the chat function, you can enter your questions and they will arrive here in Munich and you have a chance to ask Roberto directly. But in the meantime, let me add one on you personally. When we spoke over the phone, Roberto, you said to me, I always wanted to be a scientist. But when I was a teenager, you said you wanted to be either a mathematician or a physicist. Now, as a grown man, you're hurting as what happened in between? Yeah, well, you know, a lot of funny things that have happened in between. Um, I like to say that this was all because biology is what in this moment can benefit humanity the most. Some of it was, was just what happened. Uh, when I chose my, my course of study. But, you know, earning ends is part of what I see as a bigger mission, which is to truly understand how, how the genes can specify your brain. And, and, I, and I do think that that's an important question to be asked, and I'm, I'm not sorry I ended up asking that one uh, instead than others. Okay, now another interesting bit in your CV is that you spent about five years or so on a PhD in the field of immunology. Now, when you look back with all your achievements, do you say, hmm, those five years, could I just get them back and do something else? Um, no, no, those were the best five years of my life. I had a great time. Um, it was a great lab. Uh, it is true that at the beginning, the topic I started in, in my PhD uh, seems very different from doing epigenetics in ants. However, remember these microglia cells I just mentioned in your brain that do the same job as those other ant glia cells? Well, they happen to be part of the immune system in a way. So it sometimes it's funny how previous topics that you thought you would not be thinking again about, they really come back to you and you know it's a continuous journey. And the more you know, typically, the better it is. Now, we have here with us today as well a big champion of your work, Roberto, and yeah, straightforward, of you for this prize. And he was part of uh, the uh, group of people who recommended you. He is professor of medical epigenetics at the University 
of Freiburg. Here is Mark Timmers. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, happy to join you. So, Mark, there are so many bright researchers all over the world. Why Roberto? Well, I think it's actually a simple choice. Um, Roberto has developed this system you know, under the supervision of his two supervisors as a postdoc, developed the system from the ground up, um, uh, taking big risks, uh, going into ant uh, genomics, um, uh, developing a whole new model system. And there's not many people that actually um, take that risk as an assistant professor um, and, and develop and do well with it. Okay. Now you say risk taking, when we look at the current process, the idea is to publish in very reputable magazines and just don't do any silly mistakes. Is the scientific system a little bit geared against risk taking at the moment? Well, I think that you know, the, the essence of science is asking the right biological question. Um, and in the end, of course, when it ends up in a, in a big journal, you're happy. But I think uh, that the essence is really answering those questions and moving forward. Um, I think that, that should be the major motivation. So when you think about your own career with a different vantage point, about, let's say, two, two decades more advanced, what were the biggest risks you took in your own career, Mark? Well, I, actually, I come from a chemistry background, so in a sense, I, I sort of also took the risk into plunging into rather not going for a convenient career, uh, but to also uh, you know, take a risk in going into an area which is completely new. And biology is fascinating. Uh, for myself, it was also the, taking a risk, going from a, a convenient professorship in, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, joining a new community, a vibrant epigenetic community here in Freiburg, and, and, and decide to what can I contribute to, uh, to, to studying epigenetics in the context of cancer. Now, both of you have experience in Europe and in the United States. If you compare the research that's being done and particularly the risks that are being taken, what do you see when you compare the two? So when I was doing my postdoc, the US was very geared towards the supporting uh, basic science, you know, the fundamental science that is used as the foundation to build up all kinds of applications and also to address societal issues. And I, um, Roberto should correct me if I'm wrong, but I see in the US much more also a shift to the short-term gain, which is what you would call the translational research. And you can't bind, you can't build a, a, a good solid house on a, on a, if you don't have a solid foundation. And I think in Germany, that's what I found. Um, and that's hopefully what Roberto will also find. And this award is you know, really um, going into uh, a new biological system that uh, hopefully would have benefits for, 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 for you. Um, okay. And when we talk about brain plasticity, that's the important aspect. If you talk about epigenetics, you now in my field, epigenetics in cancer, that's a very important um, 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 issue. And learning from model organisms has always been beneficial. Um, the medal, medalist of this year is also an example, studying immunity in bacteria, um, yielding something like the CRISPR-Cas, which a similar prize was given. And hopefully, you know, Roberto can travel a similar path. Roberto, indeed, you, you're currently in the US and joining us through this uh, video call, but you've been working in Italy at a university and you've actually been rejected twice by German universities. Was, was it a hard decision to now accept this award? Um, was it a hard decision to accept the, the award to do the science? No, it wasn't a hard decision at all. Uh, I also am gonna correct you a little bit there. I don't remember being rejected by, by the German universities. All That's, right, apologies. Um, I, I took that from our call. I must have mistaken. Yeah, that. I must have been. But the question but, behind but, that so is. So I always, yeah. I always thought. Sorry to interrupt you. So, so I always thought Germany is a very exciting place to do research. Um, when I was deciding where to build my lab, I, I, you know, I had conversations both in Germany and in the U.S. And ultimately, I decided to stay in the U.S. That's where I was already. And, you know, sometimes there's always sort of a, a bit of inertia in deciding these moves. Um, but I am incredibly excited to accept this award and to start doing some of the work in Germany, and I'm very much looking forward to see 
um, what I already know to be true, which is the enthusiasm for the basic sciences that is still there in Germany. So I already see a lot of questions coming in from our audience, which is fantastic. Before we go there, and you can still add questions out there, what's the plan, Mark and Alberto? How are you going to spend the one and a half million euros? Well, um, most of the money um, in research goes uh, into paying for good people, paying their salaries so that they don't have to worry about it, so that they can just... Uh, Think. As I mentioned, you know, yes, I've been championing this model system for a while, but this doesn't happen in a vacuum. You see, I don't, well, I don't know if the slide is still up, but I have a, you know, nice, sizable uh, team of extremely talented scientists in the US. And so I hope, together with help from Mark and, and Marco, my other co sponsor, to build an equally talented uh, group of scientists excited to study, to study epigenetics in Freiburg. And Mark, I hear you're going to actively help uh, or about to spend the money. Any additional ideas? Well, first of all, it's his money, right? So let, let's not make any mistakes on that. Um, but I'm really looking forward you know, to the collaboration. And Alberto has a wonderful history of being very collaborative um, you know, in, in, in building up this whole system and, uh, and now we're reaping the benefits uh, of that. Uh, I don't see myself injecting ants tomorrow. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to the interaction with these people. We're going to be very close and very connected um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm really looking forward to such a you know, wonderful colleague uh, as Roberto to, to, to benefit from that. Fantastic. Now, let's go back to the ants a little bit and to your questions. First one we have over here is uh, Roberto, I was wondering, once the queen is removed from the colony or just had simply died, um, and a new worker has stepped up to become the new queen, does the change in the epigenome cause phenotypic changes as well? And you might explain phenotypic as well for everybody. So maybe I'll read that in, do the ants actually grow bigger? So the you know, phenotype is like the visible manifestation of, of, of changes in, in the genome or in the expression of the genes. Um, and and the, this person probably is aware of the fact that in many species, the queen is much bigger than the worker. And so they may be asking, you know, does the worker actually grow in size? And, and we, we see no evidence in that. But everything changes, you know, in their brain and in their ovaries. They can now lay eggs. And of course, they behave very differently. Uh, we also have some initial evidence that the changes in the structure of their brain. Um, but you wouldn't see that from the outside. You will still have to go a little bit more with the microscope to see it. Okay. But I hear a clear yes, the body changes. We have a couple of other questions uh, on the ants again. And here's one from Abi from Berlin. He's asking, now, is there a potential lineup? Can you identify before this whole Game of Thrones thing where they clash? Ah, that's going to be the most likely candidate number, a bit like Anthill looking for the super ant. Yeah, so that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, so is there, although we think everything is happening by turning on and off some genes, is there still some predetermination? Is there still something written in their genes that will make one of them um, more likely to succeed in this, in this uh, succession war, right? Um, well, the answer is we have no evidence of that. Now, that's a little tricky because in order to know a little bit about the genes, and w very often you have to unfortunately kill the ants, and then you cannot go back and ask more questions about their behavior. Um, but what, one thing we do know is that every single ant has the potential to become a queen. So when you do the, this, this tournament once, you know, a few of them, let's say you start with 10, two of them become new queens. Now, if you remove those two, two more will come and become queens. And eventually you can do this ad infinitum and that you can have any of them become a queen. If you take a single worker and you put it in a box with nobody else, they, they too will become queens. So certainly they all have the potential. Whether some of them are more likely to do it or not, we don't know that yet. Okay, super interesting. Now, there's another question on exactly that topic. 
and uh, there is a link to to uh, e elections and uh, the question what stops one and to say well okay we, we, we've got a queen now a new one but I want to be a queen too and I'll turn myself into a queen a bit like we used to have two popes back a couple hundred years we have it again and then what's your take on that yeah that's an excellent question uh, so actually the only thing that prevents it from happening is if you will social norms um, so because all the workers can become new queens um, it is very true that they could attempt it and maybe once in a while they even do so but it's the other workers that know that that's not right and so that they will police them and prevent them from laying eggs and eventually they'll go back in their ranks. Okay. So really the queen is queen partly through definition of her workers. If they don't accept her as queen, she won't survive. Yes. Okay. We, ha we have a question that links to that. And that question reads, does the behavior of the queen control the behavior of the workers or the other way around? So the, uh, question, uh, the question elaborates further. What happens if the queen's behavior is not accepted, not correct? Do the work start a revolution, a revolt and, and head the queen? <laughs> Well, um, I don't know about the behavior not being correct, but I will say that it's not necessary that the queen dies for the succession to begin. Uh, sometimes it's enough that the queen is very old and perhaps not as uh, um, prolific, is that a word, um, as it used to be. So basically once her reproductive potential has gone down, sometimes you can have the emergence of these new acting queens while the queen is still around, sort of like the two pope situation you mentioned. Okay, so a bit like not laying enough eggs, the equivalent for humans would maybe be if the economy is doing really badly and then uh, people might get grumpy. All right, I just see you nod, so very careful nodding here. Oh, sorry, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, great. Now we also have a, a quick hello from Martin Stratmann, who uh, had the video message, but he's of course following us and saying, hey, Roberto, congrats to the exceptional work you're doing. And he's looking forward to having more of uh, your teamwork in Germany and from Germany. Now, more ant question. Well, now the question is moving a bit from ant to other species. One question from the audience reads, can you simulate, Roberto, human brain disease in ants? I mean, I think simulate is a strong word and the honest answer to that should be no, but I think we can learn a lot about how the normal human brain works by studying how other normal brains in other animals work. And so this goes back to what Mark was saying about model organisms. I mean, this is something that it is occasionally lost on, on you know, the non-biologists, is how much we are all in the same boat together, how much the ant brain really is similar to the human brain in the very basic mechanisms, in the very basic way the genes function. And that's why a lot of biologists prefer to study model organisms you know, the, the basic machinery that controls genes turning on and off is really the same between me, you, an ant, a fruit fly, I mean, even a fungus. Okay, so it might be d difficult to find an ant that shows the equivalent of dementia and then develop a dementia medication. But you said we'll move up the chain if the research promising. In fact, we have a very specific question here. Uh, it reads, what is known about the epigenetics of other social species, in particular mammals, and then the question becomes really specific. What about naked mole rats, Roberto? Ah, that is it, that is it. We have a connoisseur or connoisseurs in the audience. Um, so social insects, social organisms in general have actually been uh, around for a while as potential model for epigenetics. So work that preceded ours um, in honeybees, for example, honeybees are, you know, very much similar to ants in some aspects. Um, there's been work on termites who are also social but with somewhat of a different, different structure. And in fact, the naked mole rat is the only one, I think, or um, one of very few um, mammals with, with, a, with a social structure similar to the one of ants. And so, yes, the answer is people are looking also at the systems 
Um, and I think, as I mentioned, everything we learn about any model is very important for our understanding of the whole of, of the process, right? The whole of how brain functions. Um, we think that our ends have a bit of some, some strategic advantages and that's why we focus on them. But you can certainly find very interesting studies on the naked mole rat um, and the epigenetics of other social insects, not just our ants. I have a feeling in the last couple of minutes, the amount of Google searches on the naked mole rat may have gone up. What on earth is it? How does it look like? Why is it social? So completely different talk. Uh, there is a lot of interest in the questions from our audience, from you on, uh, the, on Corazin. You mentioned it. Um, maybe briefly re-explain what was Corazin and the particular question is, is there a vertebrate homolog to Corazin or in other words, uh, might we also have Corazin? Do we humans have it? Do other vertebrates have it? Uh, yeah, that's, that's an also a good question. And the answer is yes and no. So Corazonin is, is that gene that we found uh, partially determines whether an ant will stay a worker and start hunting. Uh, which is one of the workers' job. Um, the technical term for what that thing is, is, is a neuropeptide. So it's a very, very small protein that goes out, that floats around in the brain and can control multiple uh, circuits all at the same time. Um, and um, the answer to is there a vertebrate homologue? So in other words, do I have corazonin? Do you have corazonin? Is yes and no, unfortunately. There is an homologue and it's the gonadotropin releasing hormone, um, which has some interesting links to social behavior and reproductive behavior. But the situation is a bit confusing because in ants, there's actually two versions of this neuropeptide and, and humans only have one. So it's hard to know exactly which one is which one. Okay, so it's a complicated picture. There's another question uh, on Corazin or Cora, Coracino in, Ital in, in Italian. Which word did you use? Corazonin. Corazonin is from of Spanish course, for of course, heart. basic vocabulary. And uh, the other question is, how exactly is the pathway? Um, well, maybe not too exactly, but just give us a rough idea. <laughs> Are you scared? The the. It's easy because we actually don't really know much about what is downstream or upstream, right? So you need an anchor, and we found an anchor. We found a gene that is clearly different between the cast. And now that we know that gene, we can ask this question. Now we can ask, what are the switches that turn it on and off? So these are these maybe epigenetic labels that I was talking about. Uh, and then, you know, how does it do what it does? Like, what is downstream of it that controls behavior? But we don't know the answers for either, and you know, if this person is interested, there's a, I hear that people are hiring in Freiburg. <laughs> All right, and that leads us to the question again, right? How to spend the money? We've got a really nice message from Steffen Melich from uh, Humboldt. He says, hey, again, congratulations, Roberto. Looking forward to seeing you soon. And uh, he adds, as always, uh, uh, let me ensure our greatest flexibility in helping you to spend the award money. So once you have a stash of cash, it opens so many doors, doesn't it? Sounds good. Roberto, we have some more questions uh, back uh, with the ends. And uh, one here is, how does the reproductive potential increase in ants? Um, I, I read this, what defines how um, reproductive the queen will be? Hmm, that's a tough one. Uh, well, you know, so for one thing, before uh, some of my colleagues start writing me hate mail, um, I should say I keep saying queen, the technical term for a worker that becomes a queen is actually not a queen. Um, it's called a gamergate because it means married worker in Greek. Um, and so Queens are born queens and they will forever be queens. They're a different kind of end uh, from the moment they come out of their you know, pupil case. Um, and I don't know exactly what defines the reproductive potential, but they will always you know, try to be queens and reproduce. As far as the worker becoming a gamma gate or a, as I've been calling it for this whole hour, um, an acting queen, we don't really know if there is any sort of molecular correlate of how reproductive they are. I mean, typically we just look at the size of their ovaries to get a sense. 
I don't know that I really un got this question, but... Okay, we, we, we might get a clarification. If you have another question, just send us an email afterwards and then we'll put you in touch with Roberto. Now, people are getting really creative in terms of experimental designs here, Roberto. We have two very similar questions on the lines of, okay, you told us, Roberto, if we isolate the workers, they boom, flourish into queens. And the question now is that we get from the audience, what happens if we take our splendidly isolated queens and put them together again into one colony? What's going to happen? I think we have a lot of budding ant epigeneticists in the audience, and I would love to employ them all. Uh, so those are experiments that are ongoing, not only in my lab, but in the lab with my collaborator. So indeed, um, I think if that's what the person is getting to, uh, we can revert the transition. I didn't mention it in the original talk for reasons of time, and also because we know even less about the reverse process. But once you are an acting queen, you likely will stay an acting queen, but you can manipulate the society around it to force it back into being a worker. And one of the ways to do it is what, this, uh, what you just described. Um, you can make the queens in isolation, the acting queens in isolation, you put them back in colony where there are more dominant, more established queens, they might revert back to being workers. And I think the reverse process is just as interesting or maybe more interesting than the forward process because all those changes that I described in the brain structure, in the behavior, in the genes that go on and off, because those epigenetic labels that go on top of DNA can be placed and removed without damaging the DNA information, all the changes can be reversed. I can hardly imagine how tough that must be if you're such a big queen and laying eggs and ovaries and everything and then you turn back into this tiny worker, a bit like a former statesmen that have all the trappings of power and then just become normal citizens again. But that's a different story. We have a couple of other questions for you. And by the way, you can still send them in. We have more than 10 minutes to go. So please send your questions to Roberto, typing them into the chat window in your browser. And uh, the next question for us is a congratulation again, uh, Roberto, a fantastic talk. And now what stops Oops, sorry, we just lost the questions here for a second. Let me put in one on my own, but we'll get more. Don't worry about that. Um, and that is about the application. And maybe bring Mark back in here. You have a slightly different approach uh, to the topic. You don't work with the actual ends. Thinking about your own work, how do you plan to apply the findings? What would be your next step? Yeah, so, so our interest is really how epigenetics contributes to cancer and how um, epigenetics can also be manipulated to maybe revert cancer. And I think a lot of the basic mechanisms uh, that, is, uh, that the, Roberto will be discovering, uh, we would also you know, evaluate and see how we, we can apply that uh, to, the, to the model systems that we are using. Um, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to him arriving. Okay. Uh, now, something else on mental illness. You mentioned earlier on neurodegenerative, uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So that could, could be dementia or other diseases. What could be the key of epigenetics to getting a breakthrough in treatment of these conditions? Well, yeah, so there's actually... All right, we get you both, one after another. <laughs> Roberto, have, have a go and then we'll add Mark. Um, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure who the question was for. Um, there is a lot of interest right now in looking at epigenetic changes in, uh, in neurodegenerative disease. I wouldn't say that I am a great expert in the topic. So if Mark wants to take the question, I'm happy to leave it to him. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very clear that there is a lot of, uh, for instance, genes which are on the on the, uh, the X chromosome. We know there's only one of them in males. Um, if you have mutations in those, and those are epigenetic uh, controlling genes, uh, and there's a whole variety of different human syndromes which have their origin in, in epigenetic uh, regulators on the X chromosome, and which have clear uh, phenotypes, mental retardation phenotypes, but also other developmental phenotypes. So these are typically, um, if something goes wrong in the epigenetic regulation, often 
the brain is actually the organ most affected in humans. And then there's also a strong link to cancer. What's the link between epigenetics and cancer that we know so far? Yeah, again, yeah, this is again sort of really propelled by our epi uh, capabilities of, of, of reading genome sequence of cancer cells or of, of, of normal cells, compare them. And there's a number of different cancers, bladder cancer being one of them, kidney cancer another one, where the founding mutations that are really driving the, the, the first stages of the disease are occurring in epigenetic regulators. And we're studying a, a number of them in our lab. And the cool thing actually, and Roberto already mentioned it, the cool thing is that um, many of these genes are conserved throughout evolution. So they're all present in ants, the ants that Roberto is studying. The advantage of model systems is not only they're easy or uh, manipulatable, but also uh, the complexity is much less. So one can get sort of you know, simpler, mm -hmm. simpler answers. Um, that so we have them we would feed back to our work. We have a very specific question on that point, and the question is, okay, epigenetics has been a promise to, for drug development and, and cancer therapies for a long, long time, but the big stumbling block is we, we just can't figure out which patient might benefit more. So the question is, what is the one thing we would need to understand in order to be able to use epigenetics clinically to treat cancer patients? I think this is very much related to personalized medicine. You know, one bladder cancer is not the same as the other bladder cancer. That's clearly seen um, from, the, from the genetic profile. So we would need to use genetic profiles and then use those genetic profiles to find the vulnerabilities of those cells which are lacking one or two epigenetic regulators and to combine that uh, with other therapies. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, I don't expect like a single agent developed uh, in, the, in to control epigenetics to be successful, first of all, against all cancers or in certain tissue, uh, but also uh, to, to work in isolation. Cancer has proven too complicated for that. Uh, but to combine those epigenetic drugs, and for instance, in some of the leukemias, they're already uh, you know, uh, very okay, so good examples. What I hear from, from sorry, go ahead. What I hear from you is cancer yeah, is not just nice, right? one disease, and that's why we can't expect active genetics to be the one key to, to fighting cancer, but then it's going to be a lot of work for epigenetic solutions for individual types of cancer. Yeah, for individual types of cancer, but not only based on the tissue where they're occurring, but also on the genetic changes that they have uh, 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 accumulated during the, 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 the tumorigenic process. Now, as we get closer to the end of our webcast, let's get violent again, Roberto. You showed us these horrible images of ant workers fighting to figure out who's going to be the queen. And the question we got here from our audience is, do they kill? <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, I should have mentioned that um, I was injecting a little bit of drama, you know, in the talk, actually, no ants typically are harmed in the in the proceedings. So it is a some call it a realized tournament. Uh, it's really more a display of aggression and dominance. But as far as I know, uh, typically all the ants actually survive, or the majority, I would say. What a happy end to this story! But let me. <laughs> yeah, the majority survived. <laughs> let me let me add a slightly hypothetical question, but I, I I just can't get this out of my head. When we spoke over the phone, Roberto, you told me, "Hey, if we make this work, the process from turning just a little worker ant into a queen, if we pull that off one day for humans, it would mean." We're working on everlasting life and we're working on perfect mind control. Now imagine, imagine you develop that. You found the key in your lab. You can apply it to humans, you personally. Would you switch on everlasting life? First question, second. If you had the option to do mind control with humanity, what would you tell humanity? Hmm. Yeah, that's an easy question. Um, so I will say that 
definitely you don't want everlasting life without mind control. Then things really get, get out of hand. And if you had perfect mind control, like, like switching to epigenetics, the queen, boom, very different brain function, different expression in the world, what would you I switch would, on I or will, off I will, I will switch on uh, the gene for giving even more funding to basic research. Uh, and uh, how about peace and love in the world? Fantastic, and uh, you already made clear the priorities <laughs> through the order in which you switch on these genes. Now, these are wonderful, wonderful perspectives for research. Hopefully, you two succeed in spending the money really well, and we got a lot of audience members who might be interested and uh, to whom you already suggested, hey, come over to Freiburg. There's a lot of work to do, and you can even work with cool ants like this. And for next year, I hope we'll have you all back because there will be another award next year. Next year, the category will be natural and engineering sciences. And who knows, who knows? Maybe I won't be alone next year in a library, but if we're all lucky, we can meet together again. In the meantime, all the best, Roberto. Congratulations, good luck with your work, and it was fantastic to learn from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everybody, have a great evening, have a great day, and stay safe.